on this kind of dreary, but we're really getting our taste of fall. The leaves are down, and now they're getting wet. <laughs> Um, welcome to First Presbyterian Church in Winnicani this morning. Our mission is to share God's love and shine God's light. We hope that those of you here today and watching from home will feel the love and light of God as we worship together. I have uh, three announcements this morning. One is, um, as our year continues on, Advent begins two weeks from today. And we are looking for individuals, couples, friends, families, or whatever, um, to do our Advent wreath candle lighting each Sunday morning in Advent. The, it, we'd have you sign up down, down in the entry or talk to me if you'd be interested in doing that. <clears throat> On, um, <clears throat> it's the four Sundays of Advent and Christmas Eve. Um, we also need liturgists. Coming, coming up in, in the month of December. Um, the last Bible study on the Gospel of Mark that we've been doing with Reverend Emily uh, is this Thursday morning at 9 o'clock. We meet here um, in her office, and um, we will be looking at the, the latter part of the Gospel of Mark. Um, and then we'd like to ask, are there veterans in our midst today? Can you raise your hands? And we'd like to thank you for your service uh, as we honor veterans tomorrow, correct? I think tomorrow, yes. Um, and thank you for that. Are there any other announcements? Lana? Deacons are having fellowship this morning. Deacons have fellowship this morning, okay. Anyone else? Okay, are there any prayer requests this morning? Jessica. Um, my brother Jeff's prayers, he has some issues with kidney health and is in the process of being proactive, trying to find a transplant donor. Okay. Um, so if anybody <laughs> would like more information on potentially being tested to be a donor, please let me know. I'm happy to share the information. Okay. Um, so just prayers for Jeff as he deals with the changes that are coming to his life for the next few years. Okay. So Jessica's brother Jeff seeking a transplant and um, adjusting to a change of life. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Betty? The wildfires on the West Coast, out in California, yes. Huh? And also in New York. Oh, in New York, I missed that one, okay. Well, and snow in Colorado. <laughs> um, our weather is, is uh, causing some things across the country and that it's all different. All right, anyone else? Nicole. Okay, your friend Chris and her husband. Okay. Okay. Well, let us turn our hearts and minds to worship, and for those who are able, please stand and join me in our call to worship. I gave you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praises. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. Come. Let us worship the Lord our God. Lord our God, in Jesus Christ, you have taught us that love is the fulfilling of the law. 
Send your Holy Spirit upon us and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, that we may love you with our whole being and our neighbors as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let's join in singing hymn number 667, When Morning Gilds the Skies. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have refused to hear the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy, who forgives you all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you <clears throat> in eternal life. Amen. 
one another. so much for being with us today. <laughs> Please pray with me. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, that we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zeph <coughs> uh, Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and please bring me a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run, die, run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Our New Testament reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 38 through 44 a warning against the teachers of the law. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour their widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. The widow's offering. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put everything, all she had, to live in. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for today takes us all the way out to pretty much the middle of nowhere. Just a short while before the prophet Elijah had been with the king of Israel, and he had declared that a great drought was in the forecast. But now here he sits beside a dried up ravine, dining on the scraps of meat and bread dropped by the ravens. That is, until the word of the Lord comes with a whole new direction. The parched prophet is not going to sit by the empty channel any longer because he is going to go to Zarephath. There he will meet a widow and she will supply his needs. Now, if you're anything like me, you're probably thinking, hasn't the poor man suffered enough? First a drought and leftover bird food, and now a 50 or 60 mile journey on foot just to get some drink and food from a complete stranger. Sounds miserable. But jokes aside, we probably aren't all that surprised by this turn of events, are we? After all, anyone who has ever embarked on a faith journey knows that God's call is anything but the easy road. Indeed, in his 1937 book, The Cost of Discipleship, the late German pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, when all is said and done, the life of faith is nothing, if not an unending struggle of the spirit with every available weapon against the flesh. Perhaps our own lives of faith reveal the same. I know mine does. Friends, when I was in college, I struggled mightily with my sense of call because of some of the things I had witnessed growing up in the church, the politics and the drama and the thanklessness of it all. But when I finally made peace with God's call on my life and entertained the idea of seminary, things didn't get easier. In fact, they only got harder. I felt myself drawn to Princeton Seminary in the great state of New Jersey, a place that was 12 and a half hours away from my family and friends, a place I had only ever visited once for a quick tour of the campus. As history goes, I did end up committing to Princeton, but I have to admit that it was an incredibly hard choice to make. I cried when my parents left me there in the parking lot of Princeton Seminary and made their way back to Indiana. And legend has it that my mother cried for two whole states. <laughs> there were so many sleepless nights and frankly, homesick nights when I wondered if I would be successful so far from home. There were many lonely nights when I really questioned if that was the right place and the right path for me. Now, thankfully, by the grace of God, I made it through seminary. But friends, the plot only thickened. I felt God's pull to a one-year chaplain residency in New York City another big change for a small town girl. But that wasn't all. While in the Big Apple, I was ordained as a minister of the word and sacrament just for a global pandemic to roar into the city two weeks later. The life of faith is indeed an unending struggle of the spirit. 
and I was struggling still. But I have to say, in those seasons of painful growth and homesickness, loneliness, and loss of control, I found immense comfort in the story of God's people, the ones like the prophet Elijah, who were strong and courageous, who followed God's call, even if it was difficult or uncertain. Maybe you have too. When we return to the book of 1 Kings, we see it so clearly. Upon hearing the word of the Lord, the prophet Elijah gets up and goes, making the trek to Zarephath. And what do you know? As he arrives at the gate of the city, he sees a widow there gathering sticks. And remembering the word of the Lord, he steps forward and asks her for a drink and something to eat. For her part, the poor widow is able to get the prophet a drink, but her food is already in short supply. She only has a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug, and it has been earmarked for her and her son to eat. What's perhaps surprising or striking is that the poor widow is pretty quick to change her mind as the prophet continues speaking and shares the word of the Lord with her. In fact, she soon does exactly as Elijah had asked. She makes a little cake for him and then something for herself and her son and her household. And somehow, they all had enough food to survive until the drought had ended and the Lord had sent rain to fall upon the earth. And friends, I can't help but wonder what it might be like if we responded to God's call as the prophet Elijah had. What might it be like if we heard God's call and just went? I suspect it would require a great deal of trust, especially in dire circumstances, when there is an element of uncertainty or potential danger, when it's a matter of life and death. But I also suspect that God is going to show up even in the most unexpected of ways. Remember, in the time of Elijah, widows were incredibly vulnerable with no means of economic support. Much of the time, widows were reduced to poverty, and they worked as scavengers or beggars. Indeed, there were probably widows who would not have been able to supply food and drink to Elijah. But it is in that unlikely person that God chose to reveal God's grace and goodness still. When I think back on my own faith journey, I certainly have found this to be true. In the midst of my home church's drama, I saw grace and goodness in the older adults who supported and encouraged the programs for children and youth. In seminary, I saw God in the face of my best friend, Christine, who joined me for meals and study sessions, who shared with me in my joys, but also my fears and anxieties. Even at Mount Sinai in New York, in the middle of a pandemic, God revealed God's self in the patients and families and staff who were gracious and grateful for the listening ear and the short prayers, truly the only thing I could provide when the world felt like it was falling apart. And I wonder, what about you? Who has revealed God's grace and goodness to you? Friends, I would invite you to take a moment sometime this week and think about those people whom God used for your good. Meditate on those moments. 
write those stories down, even just offer a quick prayer of thanksgiving for them. But it doesn't stop there. In the week ahead, I ask that you also consider how God has used you to reveal grace and goodness to the world. Now, I know what you might be thinking, me. I haven't done anything that others wouldn't do. I haven't done anything all that extraordinary or spectacular. But yes, you. Just as God worked through the widow in Zarephath, God can work through you and me too. And it doesn't have to be something spectacular or grand. Jesus himself reminds us of this in our New Testament reading for today. Sitting in the temple, Jesus observes all kinds of people putting money into the treasury. There are rich people putting in large sums of money. And then there is a widow just putting in two small copper coins which are worth a penny. And Jesus sees this. Jesus sees her. And he declares that she put in more than all the others, for they contributed out of their abundance. But she has contributed all she had to live on. She has contributed everything she had. And friends, I suspect that this is what God desires of us, for us to show up and be all in on this difficult road, on this life of faith. Indeed, we never know when God might show up, revealing God's self to us in the most unlikely of people and places. We never know when God might just use us in big and small ways, to reveal divine grace and goodness to the world around us. A world that is so, so much in need of grace and goodness. And so, my friends, let us go forth, ready to respond to God's call with confidence and trust equipped with eyes that are open and searching for God in the most unexpected places. All in and aware that God just might be using us too. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. I will now invite you to stand, if you are able, for our responsive hymn, Blessed Are They.
children of God. Blessed are they who suffer in faith. The glory of God is theirs. Rejoice and be glad. Blessed are you. Please be seated. The psalmist declares, the earth is the Lord and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Let us then return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. so much, Janice, for that invigorating song. If we could all please stand and join me in the congregational doxology after the offering, hymn number 367, Come Ye Thankful People Come, we're singing verse 1. Oh 
Please join me in our unison offertory prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you for everything we have, for the time, talents, treasures, and testimony you have given to us. We ask that you might accept these offerings and use them for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear us when we pray in the name of your Son. In confidence and trust, we pray for the church. O oh God, enliven the church for its mission, that we may be salt of the earth and light to the world. Breathe fresh life into your people. Give us power to reveal Christ in word and action. Today we pray for the world. Creator of all, lead us and every people into ways of justice and peace, that we may respect one another in freedom and truth. Awaken in us a sense of wonder for the earth and all that is in it. Teach us to care creatively for its resources. We pray for the community. God of truth, inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others, that all may act with integrity and courage. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. May we serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. We pray for those in need, and we lift up to you today, especially Jeff, and we ask you that you be with him on his medical journey. We pray that you surround him with a care team who is able to meet his needs, and we pray that a donor might appear in his life. Lord God, we pray for those who are affected by wildfires on both coasts. We pray for all who are affected by these changes in our climate. We pray that they might receive the resources that will benefit them. And today we pray for Chris and her family in their journey. We pray that you might strengthen them and encourage them in what is a very difficult season. God of hope, comfort, and restore all of those and all of us who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we share in making people whole. Today we remember those who have died and those who mourn. We remember with thanksgiving those who have died in the faith of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone. Loving God, in your hands we commend them. Give comfort to those who mourn. Fill the emptiness of their loss with your never-ending peace. As we approach Veterans Day, we thank you for all the men and women who have served our country. And we thank you especially for those who made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. May their example inspire and encourage us. And we pray, Lord God, for ourselves and for our ministries. Lord, you have called us to serve you. Grant that we may minister in your name with your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds your strength in our wills, until at the end of our journey, we know the joy of our homecoming and the welcome of your embrace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who first taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand once more for our closing hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Before we have our benediction, just a reminder that the deacons will have fellowship in the fellowship hall. We hope you are able to stay for just a couple minutes and join us. But hear now our benediction. Friends, go in peace to love and serve our Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, our worship service is over. Our service in the world begins.